with any form of response and particularly what Honorable Likota had to say. But against that advice, I decided that let me rather set the record straight. <laughs> Honorable Lakota is correct in saying we were detained in the same trial event in 1974. Then I was 21 and a couple of months old. I was a student at the University of the North. I had then been elected the chairman, as we used to call it those days, of the South African Students' Organization branch, with Steve Biko and others, Barney Pichana and others, Harry Nguekuru, and many others being the gigantic leaders of SASO at the time. And we got involved through a call that had been made to organize pro freli rallies. The chairperson of the Students' Representative Council, Sidibe, who was the president, rather, of the SRC, got deeply immersed in this, and so did a number of us. And following the pro filimo rallies that we held, the then government decided to conduct a soup on all of us. Now, my arrest was quite dramatic because Sidibe, the president of the SRC, had been arrested and he had, uh, we, we decided to march on the Mangueng police station, which Honorable Malema will be most familiar with. We marched on that police station as a student body and during that march, the SRC went in and some of us stayed outside. And they then decided that they wanted to have me arrested. They then said, call Ramaphosa in because he can shed light on whatever. And the SRC members, without knowing that this was going to happen, called me in and uh, as soon as I sat down, they said, you can all leave now. Ramaphosa is now under arrest. And I was arrested, transported to Pretoria Central Prison, where I was in solitary confinement for a solid six months before anyone came to talk to me. And at the time, my father was a policeman. He was a police sergeant. And through his efforts, I finally got to see him. And he explained to me that, well, they say they've got a lot of things against you and all that. What did you do? And I explained to him, he said, my son, I understand. Then later, they started interrogating me, which was quite vicious. I will not go into that. And uh, the issue that they really wanted from me was to give evidence against accused number one, Seth Cooper, Montu Mieza, accused number two, Terra Licota, accused number three, and a number of others. And I refused. And they thought they would use my dad to put pressure on me to agree to become a state witness. I refused. I said, I will not do it. Then I was taken, I was taken to Silverton Police Station. And when I got there, my neighbor in the adjacent cell was another detainee whose name I am not going to disclose because something horrible happened to him. And they had been working on him to also become a state witness. And he then, through talking through the wall, told me that he has finally agreed to become a state witness. And then I realized why I had been taken to Silverton. My dad came to visit me, and he said, they want you to be a state witness. And I said, Dad, I am not going to do it. I will never betray the comrades that I was working with. And if I did, where will I go and live thereafter? I refused. Now, having refused, my neighbor then went and gave evidence. He gave evidence against Terra Lakota and all of them. And as I persistent, persisted in my refusal to give evidence, they let me go, but they brought me back and said, we still want you to give evidence. 
and I persisted in refusing. He gave evidence, the trial went on, it ended, and they were sentenced. And then I was released. Now, you know, when you deal with police, security police, there are three things that they want from you. It's either you cooperate with them, you give evidence against your comrades, or you become an Askari and go and kill your comrades, or you become a paid agent. I did not do any of the three things that they wanted. Not at all. Not at all. And when they released me for the last time, they then said, we want you to work with us. And I still remember who it was. It was uh, Major Haystack. He said, we want you to work with us. And I said, I will never agree to work with you and betray my people. And they said, we will come back to you. The uprising in 76, after my spell of detention, I then joined the Black People's Convention because university would not take me back. So I joined the BPC, uh, which was a black consciousness-oriented organization like, this, like SASO, and we continued with the struggle. 76 happens, and on the very day the uprising happened, a knock at three o'clock at my father's home sounded on the door, and interestingly, there was a comrade of mine who was later killed by the Venda police. His name was Chifiwa Muope. We were friends at high school and he had come to visit me. And on the 16th, they found him sleeping with me in the dining room. They arrested both of us and he looked so much like Tsietsi Machinini. And they immediately said, we've got Tsietsi Machinini who was leading the uprising. They took me to John Foster Square, where I was for another six months. And interestingly, Terra Licota, when I got into the cell, I told myself that I am now here for five years. Because earlier they had been threatening me with a five-year, ten-year jail sentence. And I persisted in refusing to give evidence. And they said, you are going to be like Nelson Mandela, you are going to break rocks on Robben Island. I said, in the end, I would rather go and break rocks and I will never, ever betray my people. And my father supported me in all this, notwithstanding the fact that he was a police sergeant in the South African police of the time. He supported me. And after I was uh, detained in 76, I was finally released without any charge being preferred to me or against me. Chipiwa Muofe was later released because they found that Chipiwa Muope was not Tsietsi Machinini, and in the end, he was later once detained again and killed by this, the Venda police. Following that, then my journey led me into the unions where I organized workers. And I want to take time to explain to uh, Julius, uh, Honorable Malema, about the organization of the NUM. Because that is another issue that has been raised in the past. And the question has always been, the NUM was an Anglo-American project. That's what has always been raised. And that story started being spread by some within our own ranks, who had at the time been given the responsibility to go and organize mine workers. And because their approach had not worked, they then started spreading a story as they saw the NUM growing. Now, how did we organize the NUM? James Mutlazi, Elijah Bahai, and a number of others, Paul Nkuna, bear testimony to this. We went into the mines, started trying to organize, and mine workers would not join the union. They said, you are insurance agents, why should we come and join the union? And the question they kept on asking, Honorable Malema, have you got permission from management to come and organize us? And we said, no. They said, we don't want to get fired, so we're not going to join your union. And in any event, we think it's an insurance company. And they kept asking me, where do you come from? I would say, I come from Soweto. They said, you are a skelem from Soweto, and we're not going to join this thing of yours. 
and our initial plans to organize mine workers were failing. And as we saw that they were failing, we decided that rather than organize them in the way, in the streets, in the corners, in the towns, in the buses, we should rather go into the fortress where they are accommodated. Because those days, mine workers were accommodated in fortresses which were impregnable and you could not go in and we decided, yes, to go to the Chamber of Mines. And we said, the Vihan Commission has now declared that black mine workers can join unions. We want, to join un we want them to join unions. Give us access, because we do need the access to organize them. And access had been given in a number of other unions. In the factories, offices had been opened in factory uh, environments and what have you. So we said, like it's happening in factories, we want access in the mine hostels. Previous to that, the attempts to organize mine workers, Honorable Malema, had been to try and get them in buses as they are going home uh, in the rural areas, and they had all failed. So we decided that we will take another direction, and we did. We got access, we started organizing mine workers, and they kept asking, do you have permission? We said, yes. At the time, Anglo-American and Rand Mines were the only two mining houses that had allowed unions, their workers, to join unions. And naturally, the union started growing. And it grew by leaps and bounds. And I've often said to those people who say, you are an Anglo project, I would say, why would Anglo act against its own interests? because it was Anglo-American which was most severely affected in the strikes that mine workers embarked upon. In 1987, they got the biggest brunt of uh, the, uh, the, the, the strike at the time. So the union grew, and not only did it grow, the NUM was the first union to adopt the Freedom Charter in our country. The very first union. And following that, the NUM was the biggest motivator for the formation of COSATU. And it was the biggest union in COSATU. Now, Honorable Likota and Honorable Maimani, Ma Malema, rather, you raise these issues and throw around innuendo. You must realize how dangerous this is, like Dr. Mutualedi said yesterday. The same accusation was made against Nelson Mandela when he was still in prison. Many people said Nelson Mandela was selling out. They said he was selling out because he had agreed to be separated from his comrades and was therefore in Polsmo alone and he was being manipulated and he was selling out. That is the story that was peddled around. But when I met Walter Sisulu, the wise leading comrade of our movement, when I asked him about this, I said, how did you, as the elders of our movement, handle this? They said, we were never concerned about this. We looked at the character of the leader that Nelson Mandela was. That's what we looked at. And having examined his character and seen the commitment that he had made to the freedom of our people, we were least concerned about all that. Now, comrades and members of, on the other side, these accusations of people selling out have also led to the deaths of people, as Dr. Aaron Mutualedi said in this very parliament. Now, Honorable Malema, you visited, you visited London a few years ago and said that Nelson Mandela was a sellout. And then there were reports, and those reports keep coming, and I was not even intending to raise it here. But I do so because we do need to deal with this issue. Issue because it's cancerous. A report that came out was that the EFF is an MI6 project. Now, I rejected that. I rejected that because I knew we were dealing with people of good character. That you would never 
go to that extent. And they keep coming with a position that one holds now. You keep getting all these innuendos, these accusations, and these suggestions. But in the end, you need to deal with the character of the person. Now, I have rejected those types of statements, Honorable Malema, because I look at you and I look at your character and your commitment to the people of South Africa from the platform that you now occupy. Now, it was O. R. Tambu who warned us that be beware of the wedge driver. Watch his poisonous snake. These stories that are spread about people doing that and that are so dangerous. Nelson Mandela had to deal with this issue when he became president of the ANC. And he said, I keep getting all these reports. And he once said, I was his secretary general. And he said, I get all these reports and if I were to examine them all, more than half of the members of my NEC you remember that. More than half the members of my NEC would be regarded as spies. And it would divide the African National Congress. And he added, it would even lead to people getting killed. Now, let us be aware of wedge drivers. Let us be aware of people who seek, who want to spread poisonous messages amongst us. I can testify I have never ever been a spy, I've never worked with the enemy, all I've ever done in my life is my commitment to the people of our country, that's all. That I've never done. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. We will still come to the end. I'm sure you'll have more time at that point. <laughs>